this concept of digital ownership within Nintendo Switch games. These assets that we are so familiar with, owning an island in Animal Crossing or when I play Super Smash Brothers, like when they reward me with their in-game coins, these are concepts that everybody is already familiar with. So it's natural to me that it translates to NFTs, which now has real value. You know, it's not just the IP is owned by like a certain company anymore. It's like you own the IP of digital goods and assets, but also that these are hopefully tradable. It's like literally the metaverse is an entire ecosystem that is cross game, cross chain, and just like the digital realm. In a fast-moving and confusing crypto asset market, get an edge with Crypto Slate Edge. Enhanced in-depth news coverage and extensive crypto asset and sector data are all part of your exclusive access as a member, helping you understand the market with features such as on-chain metrics and sentiments, all of which allow you to convert knowledge into action with an ad-free experience. As a bonus, access our private Telegram channel to receive live insights whilst engaging with the CryptoSlate community. Subscribe now at CryptoSlate.com forward slash edge. People Pleaser, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on Fortune Magazine. That's quite a milestone in your life, isn't it? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, it happened all so quickly, but um, I'm just very grateful for the opportunity, of your course. Your contribution, probably, it's well-deserved. That's all <laughs> I can say. And I'd love to ask you, um, People Pleaser, like, you know, obviously you're an NFT artist. You're also a woman in crypto kind of a minority in this group? Or are you seeing progress on that front? How is it in this space these days? Yeah, uh, honestly, I find the community to be very inclusive, um, especially the DeFi community is, you know, and I talk about this often, which is so just the fact that there are a lot of so many anonymous profiles out there, like you don't even actually have to be a person. Um, and then as long as you're putting out cool work, people will recognize that and endorse that. And so I think a lot of the NFT community are coming in from like traditional art or um, that kind of like world where I think there is a little bit more sort of like gender disparities. I mean, just looking at, you know, all the highest selling traditional artists are all male. Um, you know, there's a huge like price gap between, you know, what females generate versus what males generate. Yeah. Um, the community often has like a lot of like gatekeeping, you know, it's all about like networking, knowing the right people. And so those are the kinds of concepts that I hope um, does not continue in NFTs and Web3 because, you know, we have this new blank slate that we can start over with and set new ground rules. Right. And so that's why I hope that, you know, more of that inclusive inclusivity um, can be incorporated. And, you know, people often talk about gender disparity in tech as well. And I have been meeting very a lot of very talented women, you know, not just artists, but um, builders, entrepreneurs um, within crypto, and then they're popping up more and more recently. So that's always nice to see. And I hope that it continues on an upward trend. <laughs> you know, it's funny that you mentioned gatekeeping. Is that one of the biggest problems in traditional the traditional art world? Because I'm not going to name the person by respect. But uh, an artist that I know that's very talented, he started working for a famous artist that had his group. And every time he produces artists, it always goes through some sort of layering of the first group, the ultra VIPs have first access to auction on that specific piece of art. Mm -hmm. And then it goes down and it's really, really exclusive. Yep. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, we we see that with that like community. I mean, I'm not super tapped into the traditional art world, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know anybody there. I don't know the right people, certainly, you know, but I do know from speaking from other people who have had those experiences, like, you know, how many hoops that you have yeah. to jump through um, by networking, trying to know the right people, the right galleries, you know, and it's all about, yeah, just getting that boost from a very, very small sub group of people who are, you know, trying to protect their, I guess, status in the space, right? And um, 
but luckily, you know, for me, I feel like, and, and you know, we saw that translating over as well in the beginning with NFTs. I think, you know, a lot of these platforms like super rare, I mean, you know, understandably they want to maybe upkeep a certain, what they perceive as quality, yeah. but um, that sort of goes against the idea of decentralization and Web3 is all about community and collectivism. And so, you know, in the beginning they were gatekeeping as well. Like, you know, the only artists with certain amounts of following on Instagram, for example, were allowed in the platform. And um, I, I do feel like that's a negative EV move for a lot of the platforms. And they're probably seeing that more and more now. I could also be just saying this because I did not come from, you know what I mean? Like I didn't have any followers when yeah. I started in the NFT space and um, crypto. Um, but luckily because of, you know, sort of, I started more from like the DeFi um, community and people were way more welcoming there. You know, they didn't judge me or think that my art was bad just because I didn't have any followers. Um, you know, if they think it's cool, they'll tweet about it, you know, endorse it. And that's kind of how I built my current following, you know? And so I'm really grateful to all, obviously communities um, that are not exclusive. And I hope that it stays that way, or I will, you know, at least now, hopefully, um, just continue to sort of spread this message. Is that what really makes you the happiest in terms of this whole NFT space is the fact that it's a peer to peer, no agency, you're directly in touch with one person and nothing else is, I mean, is there, are there any other things that are more beautiful than that for you as this NFT artist or? Um, I mean, yeah, well, I think it's just sort of, you know, this has been, the song has been sung so many times, but it's just bringing power to the creators, right? Yeah. There's this inversion of um, control and it used to be, you know, creators are after the platforms and now platforms are after creators. It's a very interesting paradigm shift to witness as well. And, um, you know, the concept of like owning your own IP yeah. um, is very new. And so, um, and just sort of now you have a way of transferring what previously would be perceived as like arbitrary um, things of value like clout or, you know, following into real monetary value. If you consider this magic internet money that we deal with <laughs> to actually be real money, then yeah. <laughs> that is super cool. And, you know, like when I see NFTs, obviously I didn't really get it back in the day, but recently I had a little bit of a hum and I want to share with you, you're going to think I'm weird, but my daughter was playing this Nintendo Switch game. Mm -hmm. And Love it was a Nintendo really, Switch. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you I know the one. Just Dance games? Yes, I do. <laughs> so it was 2021, the new one, right? Mm -hmm. And after like getting some points, she earned some sort of virtual sticker. It's like a puzzle oh, sticker. Cool. And all of a sudden, like she, she looked at me and she said, Daddy, I have already four stickers. I'm so happy to collect these. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh my God, I never understand NFTs, but it's a generational thing. I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I actually, you know, just on the panel that I did was talking about, I literally brought up Nintendo Switch as an example, but, you know, perhaps maybe you think there's like a generational thing, but to me, it comes so naturally. I, I was just saying it as if this is something that everybody is familiar with or this concept of digital ownership, you know, within like Blizzard games, um, Nintendo Switch games, um, you know, these assets that we are so familiar with, you know, owning an, an island and Animal Crossing or when I play Super Smash Brothers, like when they reward me with their in-game coins um, so that I can, you know, unlock new features or whatever. These are all uh, concepts that everybody is already familiar with. Um, and so it's natural to me that it translates to NFTs, um, which like I also was saying now has sort of real value because yeah. I can't take my Nintendo Switch tokens and go, I mean, maybe somebody will buy them and I don't really know, but you know, the whole concept of the metaverse and now with crypto and the blockchain and NFTs is actually just capturing that. And then also hopefully, you know, being able to do things across game, you know, it's not just the IP is owned by like a certain company anymore. It's like you own the IP of, you know, digital goods and assets, but also that um, these are hopefully tradable in, yeah, just, just, it's like literally the metaverse is an entire ecosystem that is cross game, cross chain, um, and that, I guess just like the digital realm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's really funny. My mom is an artist and uh, I still picture her like picking up these heavy paintings and having to move them around where an NFT, you just have it in your pocket, right? Yeah. It's like, we have to move. Yes, it's <laughs> I know. And I've been taking on a more of a nomadic lifestyle recently. So like many. 
<laughs> yes, um, I think probably inspired by COVID and many other reasons. But now I also feel like having physical possessions is so burdening. Yeah, um, especially when you're moving around all the time. I'm just like, oh, I don't need stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Literally, I still have that image. It's very vivid. And I'd love to ask you, but what makes a cool NFT these days? Obviously, you've had great success. Uh, I don't, I'm not asking you to share your secret recipe, but <laughs> what is a cool NFT these days? How do you see, oh, this is probably going to be successful. Like these dogs or these animals are going to be a successful collection. Like what are some things that you look at when you're looking out there? Well, coming from like the creator's perspective, especially when I was starting out, right. And I didn't have sort of like a following because I feel like now, you know, if you're Gary Vee or someone, uh, you drop anything, anything. people are just going to buy it. Right. Um, and so when, what do you do when you are not that, you know yeah. what I mean? This is the same concept of celebrities coming in and dropping an NFT. It's just by association, it has value, right? But mm. when you're not somebody who's already famous, how do you create something yeah. that, um, has value? And I spoke a little bit about this on the panel where, um, you know, sort of, I think it's very interesting and fascinating to explore like memes and yeah. what makes a meme viral. Um, I mean, memes are essentially the fastest and the most efficient way to spread information. Yeah, it's um, and, you know, there's obviously an element of humor, um, but also I think there's like that serendipitous, you know, last chunk where it's kind of random and, you know, nobody can actually artificially create that or grasp mm -hmm. that. You know, for example, why did the Doge meme become so viral, right? I mean, but I'm not going to lie, you know, when I first saw Doge, you know, but it's a, it's not just the image itself, but the culture that was created yeah, around it, you know, incredible. the funny sort of grammar that is used and the comic sans font. And I, I don't know, it's just like that combination just makes me, it's, it's infectious, you know, and it makes me want to talk like that on the internet or something and want to share it with my friends. And so I find it so fascinating to how do you, um, you know, sort of recreate that kind of uh, level of virality. And um, so, you know, with NFTs, this is a very similar phenomenon where, I and mean, obviously, I think community building is very important. So part of why Bored Apes became so huge is because they're they are very good at, you know, sort of like building their community. But, you know, like I said, there's always that last level of serendipity that is very hard to quantify and to um, predict or measure, um, which I find so fascinating. And so f coming from, you know, when I was looking at my original work or when I first started creating in the space, um, I also was often studying things that are viral or, you know, things that just uh, permeate the mind, right? Mm. And then trying to first try and see if that element is recreatable. And then how do I inject that into my work um, so that my work can spread faster as somebody who didn't already come from being famous. And so, you know, there's some ways like usually I think um, for me, these are just like my recipes and, you know, it's not a secret. I can share it. I don't really care. Um, I often find things that are trippy um, are cool. People find cool, so they want to uh, share that. Um, and also, you know, my, when you take a look at Japanese commercials, they're yeah. often very ridiculous and over the top, yeah. um, which ties back to the whole sort of like concept of memes and having a sense of humor. Yeah. Um, so I'm incorporating that um, into my work has helped the spread of it as well. And, you know, several other things. But those are kind of the ways that I like to think about it. The, the trippy word sounds like the perfect word, doesn't it? For the cool NFT. If it's trippy, then it'll probably go viral, right? Yeah. Or if it's cute, you know, like yeah. I thought <laughs> Cool Cats is cute. Pudgy penguins are cute. Um, recently, I discovered this collection called Chubby Corns and I literally bought one because they're cute. Well, I actually have a funny story recently. So I did a collaboration with Steve Aoki um, and then we took some pictures like outside of Sotheby's and then when he treated one of them and this is sort of like a, a story of how you know I discovered a community or something so basically there's these <laughs> NFTs called chubby corns they're like, these, how, like how are they called <laughs> they're called chubby corns but they're like these really cute looking unicorn things that are like chubby and they all have like really weird funny haircuts um, he's, go, he's going and buying one. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right now. Yes. Um, yeah. but so how I discovered them was somebody like, because you know how Steve Aoki does those like jump photos where he's like jumping in the air, so he like he made us do one, and then somebody like photoshopped 
like chubby corns <laughs> into our photos. It looked like we were like riding these chubby corns and it was actually a really well done Photoshop job. And then, so through this, we obviously I didn't know what they were. I was like, but because somebody did this, you know, I discovered it. And then, so then when Steve Aoki and I were at the Sotheby's dinner, we were like, we were like, look at this photo. Like it's so well done or whatever. And then we were just like joking about it. We're like, oh, we should just like buy some, you know? They're actually like, they were kind of expensive because there's only 250 of them, <laughs> but because they're so cute. Um, so whatever their strategy was, it totally worked, you know, like, and then, then when we bought some, like the entire like community was like, oh my God, like Steve Aoki and people pleaser like bought some chubby corns and then they started making a bunch of like fan art and meme art um, around it, you know, and then just like, so I feel like that's, to me, I was like, well, this community clearly knows what they're doing. Like, you know, they built up this brand like really quickly and then they're also like providing things like, you know, that we would perceive of like value, which is like creating memes and, you know, like new fan art and all of this kind of stuff. They're like very fast at like what they do. Um, yeah. And then shortly after, like, you know, some well-known collectors like Triple Eight was like, I'm going to buy Chubby. Like he placed like bids on like 15 of them or something like. Um, so this is just like a funny story and an example of how a community can be built just on social media by, you know, spreading the word. Um, so yeah, like I said, there's many, many reasons why. And then uh, of course it's also subjective and that's why we're seeing so many different communities spring up. And that's the beauty of it is I think, you know, there is a community for, um, everybody with different tastes if you're looking for it. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have a tough question for you a little bit, but, um, you know, once you become famous, as you're saying, it's kind of like one at whatever you do, like Gary Vaynerchuk, if they do something, it will be successful. But is there a little bit of pressure from an artist standpoint where you're like, if you have like a crazy hit, like your memes or your your actual NFTs become an absolute crazy success that the bar has gone so high, suddenly you're like, oh my God, what am I going to do to surpass that? Isn't that like- Of a course. Yeah. I mean, one. so I guess I'm, maybe my- Obviously, I've been building up my community since DeFi yeah. summer and my sort of like OG fans know me from there. And yeah. I've created, you know, multiple, multiple animations before. But I think the one that most people know me from or like my magnum opus, let's say, was probably the Uniswap V3 animation that I did in March. Because the announcement itself was already a very, very highly anticipated event. So that certainly helped. You know, I'm not going to take all the credit and say, but my animation, I think, also contributed. So basically, the animation went viral. Like the day they posted it, within 24 hours, it got over half a million views. Um, and I remember Hayden Adams, he's the creator of Uniswap, told me he's like, "Yeah, your video or that tweet is uh, still our like most liked and most engaged tweet up to date." And so, and then obviously, then I dropped it as an NFT, and then it sold for half a million dollars. Um, and Pleaser Dow was created, and then so. After that experience, I remember I was talking to a friend and I was like, um, I feel like that was my peak probably. And <laughs> I'm, you know, it's all downhill from here, basically. Yeah, I was like, I should probably just never drop an NFT again because how can I top that, you know? Um, but, and so definitely I think there's always some kind of like pressure. Um, and I, I am also a competitive person. So, you know, like I do look at other artists in the space, like, Oh, when they sell something, you know, and then like, I don't do as well. It's like, oh, did I do something wrong? But then, you know, I think now I'm getting better at sort of just being more focused on my mission and the message mm -hmm. that I'm trying to spread as opposed to the numbers that I generate. And then, yeah. you know, luckily, like, you know, these things don't happen very often, but luckily later uh, this summer, right in the same year, um, I had the opportunity to do the cover of Fortune magazine. And that also went super viral. Um, and so... You know, I would say like, oh, well, I guess that was Uniswap wasn't my only peak, you know, of the year. Yeah. And I, I hope that, you know, it's hard to predict or know when these things are going to happen. But at the very least, um, my own ethos is that when I see an, a good opportunity, I will take it and I will work hard and, you know, put the effort into doing the best work that I can. And if I keep doing that, hopefully I'll have more peaks in the future. <laughs> uh, so many hidden gems of what you're saying here on how you've built your success and hopefully people appreciate all these tips and stuff like that. I have to ask you, so it's kind of make me think, you know, when you think about memes, but also the meme coins, right? If I really understand what you're telling me, it almost feels like how did a Shiba Inu or how did a Dogecoin go up so high in market cap when it doesn't really have fundamental value? Mm -hmm. Is it just the fact that there's that virality that you mentioned? plus the building of a community mm -hmm. are, 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 could, 
Are there any other like specific points that made projects so successful in your eyes? Um, I mean, I, I think specifically with meme projects, um, those are probably the main points, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, obviously other projects that, you know, like either they have utility or something, you know, probably they're successful because they have a great team, great team. Um, you know, great development, like great code, great marketing. You know, there's so many elements um, that contribute to why something can be successful and always probably the element of luck as well. Of luck, yeah. It's mm -hmm. always like, I read a book actually back in the day it was saying that success is a combination of skill and luck, right? And the yep. more skill you have, the less luck you need. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, Absolutely. This is probably a question that everyone asks you, literally. Like, what is the future of NFTs? Everyone is wondering what's the next step or what are some developments that you as an NFT artist want to see maybe next year, maybe a limitation you still have at the moment? Is it the chain scalability of Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera? But, but what is like the happy scenario for People Pleaser in 2022, for instance, or, <laughs> or beyond? Uh, well, the happy scenario is that NFTs are way more mainstream than they are now, or you know, there's less people calling it a scam and sort of understanding why uh, the tech itself is revolutionary. Um, and um, yeah, just like this widespread of information, I hope. And then in sort of terms of utility, I mean, I think currently Web3 is kind of being held together by duct tape. So I don't even think we're ready for the masses if they want to join now because, you know, so many things um, <laughs> break, I think probably because we're so early. And then, you know, like, can you imagine if all of the developers of, let's say, who are working on tech startups in Silicon Valley suddenly migrate over to Web3, then we'll get... A, definitely a boost in yeah. terms of um, product development and just you know efficiency and just things growing in the space and so hopefully you know I think in 2022 we'll see more of that as well as um, just I don't know like currently I'm, you know no offense to all the metaverses but just like our hardware hasn't really caught up yet so you know it's like I try to run I mean Decentraland is cool but it's not immersive right like it's like I try to run it on my laptop and then it's slow half the time, either because of internet or my hardware or something, you know what I mean? And so um, we need our tech, as in real life tech, to um, sort of catch up for this to be um, way bigger as well. But when we get to that point, you know, I hope to see, you know, I was thinking like, how cool would it be like, I have bored apes, right? And obviously people are like, these are really valuable, but in, in the metaverse or something, if you Ooh. hold a bored ape NFT, it'll just generate an actual monkey that's walking around or something. And then you can use that to flex in the metaverse. It's like way cooler than just looking at a JPEG, right? So these are probably things that I would be excited about. That would be so crazy. So an NFT that eventually in the metaverse becomes a life. character, comes yeah. to life, that can maybe produce other NFTs if they sure. have children or... Yeah, because then right now, you know, when you're, people are talking about breeding or yeah. like the mutant apes, yeah. I mean, it's just... It, they're just using JPEGs to sort of represent it, but we're conceptualizing it in our own heads. But imagine you can actually see it happen. That's pretty wild. <laughs> that would be so wild. Like, how far are we, do you think, in terms of hardware limitation to actually having a metaverse that, you know, we... It's too, yeah, it's too hard to say. Uh, honestly, That's too I crazy. think we're at least three years away, probably. I don't know, though. Yeah. But that would be crazy. Yeah. Mind-blowing. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Uh, last message you'd like to share with the community. Like uh, it's been, seriously, it's the first time that I've had such a perspective from the NFT art world. And, you know, thanks to my daughter and people like you, I'm starting to get educated and understand hopefully people out there as well. But any last message you'd like to share? I guess the last message is just that I hope, you know, I think something that's so cool about Web3 is the concept of, um, you know, more people contributing or working together is better. Um, this is the same thing with DAOs. You know, it's like, I can't do everything myself, but when I band together with other sort of talented individuals, then you can create cooler and bigger things and tackle more complex problems in humanity. And so I just hope that, you know, to sort of, because we are previously like in web two, there's like all these middlemen and corporations taking a lot of money. So then we have more limited resources and that causes people to be either more competitive or like the gatekeeping mindset, you know, um, and so th those are normal, but it's like to really be immersed and change to web three, you really have to change the way that you think and go alone if you want to go fast. But if you go together, um, you'll go further. Beautiful note to end this interview. That it's being all together, moving together forward. It makes a lot of sense. And thank you so much for coming on the show. If you enjoyed this, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. 
and blast that bell notification so you get access to more of these timeless interviews. Thank you so much for watching. See you next week, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. Thank you.